Hello everyone! Finally, the first part of long-awaited episode 69 is out, and I'm here to break all the secrets and Easter eggs I managed to find for you. Get your tea and snacks ready, as it will blow your mind. Let's go! The episode starts with POV fighting one of Skibidi toilets with robotic hands. The fight seems to be on for quite some time because this toilet really looks to be worn out, as his whole face sloughs off in patches. And there's something really interesting about his eye. Did you think it was just reddened or something? Well, actually, it's a little red crane that is sort of implemented into his eye socket. And it's nothing else but a reference to the official Valve's logo, which is a company that created Gary's Mode and Half-Life series. Moreover, it's this exact company owning Source Filmmaker Workshop, which was also used by DeFuke while making Skibidi series. In episode 33, we saw the reference to how DeFuke's Skibidi toilets quite literally destroyed YouTube. Can it be another reference, but this time about how Dafuk destroyed Valve? That would be really funny. Valve Skibidi fiercely impales the left POV's hand, but no blood can be seen, as POV is just a robot. By the way, keep that bloodless scene in mind, as there will be something weird about it later. But our guy already has something to answer with. He uses the knuckle duster on his right hand, and smacks Skibidi in the face, then hitting him with both of his legs like an MMA pro wrestler. As Skibidi gets leaned back, we see a human skeleton on the left side of the screen. And finally, here comes the punch finishing the whole combo of hits. Now check out this weapon that may seem like a spiky mace at first. Thay's actually a plunger equipped with all sort of spikes on it. So our POV is still Plunger Man, the same as it was in the previous episode. And I have a theory about all those spikes on his iconic weapon. I think they may be parts of metallic claws and legs of Bunker Skibidi that he destroyed. Also, based on the fact he managed to heavily upgrade his plunger, I can state there was some time passed between episodes 68 and 69, and I think our team deepened in the bowels of the bunker greatly. POV's spiky weapon simply destroys the Skibidi toilet's face, denting it into the toilet's drain, while the black speaker man does his own work in the background. By the way, guys, I think there's something definitely sassy going on here. What Black Speakerman does actually reminds me of the infamous cameraman versus Skibidi toilet scene from episode 56. He fights another Skibidi toilet with modernized robotic hands, while also taking two of the lately upgraded parasites at the same time. This guy is really good at handling the knives. Look at how gracefully he pinched one of those pricks to the wall and how he ended another one's fuss with one simple movement of his weapon, without even looking at him. Also, check out the scene where one of Parasites actually managed to attach to Black Speaker Man literally for a few seconds, but then got thrown off his back anyway. I think there is a certain time period that needs to pass in order for a Parasite to take control over someone's body. Or maybe Black Speaker Man is also immune to Skibidi Parasites, just as Titan TV Man Next to him I can see another breathless body, and it's a human skeleton too, which is dressed in the scientist's robe. And as we'll move deeper into the Skibidi bunker, we'll see that those skeletons and parts of them are all around the base, which immediately raises a question. What if there were human scientists at first on this base? Maybe this base was originally built by humans, but then it was conquered by Skibidi army? My theory can be proven by the size of the base's doors and its openers. They seem to be not meant for Skibidi at all. Or maybe humans were also a part of the whole Skibidi experiment at some points. Maybe they were test subjects meant to be transformed into Skibidi toilets. That could have explained lots of headless skeletons we saw in the base. But it's no time for POV to get distracted, as he almost got hit by another parasite jumping at him out of nowhere. But luckily, POV is quite a master in the fighting too, so he smashes the nasty thing down with one gentle sweep of his mace. As the parasites are done with, the camera goes to the right, and we see all the survivors left in the Elite Alliance squad. What bothers me a lot is the fact that the whole squad seems to be absolutely ignorant towards what's happening around them, so POV Plungermen and Black Speakermen are the only ones who actually fought. I mean, just look at this. There's the snobby Speakermen on the left, which apparently does as much good as he did in the previous episode, meaning, not really much. He just leans on the wall, waiting while all the dirty work will be done without him. And there's a bunch of ordinary cameramen with the speakermen holding the baseball bat among them. All six of them are busy messing with one helpless skibidi toilet which seems to get it all. He's being fried by one of cameramen's rifle. And also look at what speakerman with the baseball bat is doing. 
He's bonking the poor Skibidi's head as if it wasn't his weapon, but an actual ding-dong. And not going far from this, check out these two sweet doves laying in the very sassy position on the ground. Surely that's the reference to the number of today's episode, and I'm sure you catch what I mean, guys. Also, it reminded me a lot of the secret sassy leak of episode 67 that was shown in Dafuk's official Discord channel, where Titan Cameraman and Titan Speakerman laid in the same exact position with G-Man watching them from above. Dafuk seemed to be in a really silly mood while making this episode, and I love it. And of course, there's our white terracotta brother in the center of the screen, as if he's the main guy deserving all the spotlight. He's pressing the body of the Skibidi Parasite to the ground with his right leg while checking the tablet effortlessly. Also, it's worth mentioning that the whole crowd is standing next to the giant door that looks really similar to the one that we saw at the entrance to the bunker. As the camera goes to the left, we can see the weird Skibidi face on one of the doors that are closest to the squad. What's interesting about it, no one seems to be paying any attention to this guy, although he looks hella creepy to me. And spooky stuff isn't stopping there. Look at those two pricks slowly peeking out of the doors opening next to Black Speakerman picking his knives up. As he turns his head to them, they still don't really bother him as it looks to me. He just walks from them as if they aren't even there. He's such a chad in this episode, oh my god. I would have been mad scared at this point if I were in his shoes though. As our team passes through the row of doors lit by the creepy red emergency light, I cannot help but remember the standard horror asylum corridors with the doors that look just like those we see in this episode. I really have this eerie feeling like we're about to see some sort of mental patients here that were intended to play roles of test subjects for Skibidi scientists here. As POV Plungerman goes deeper into the corridor, we see one of Skibidi on the left burning alive, and on the right side, we notice the big Skibidi head trembling in some sort of fit. It reminds me a lot of the effect TV men's screens have on Skibidi toilets, and also of the similar effect of the Hypno Gun invented by Make a Scientist Cameraman. My guess is this guy may be some kind of subject meant to get resistant of TV men's glow or Hypno Gun damage. The white terracotta goes straight to the panel opening the large door, and we see how he has both the remote controller and the tablet in his hands. As POV comes a bit closer, we see three skeleton Skibidi toilets which are apparently alive. If you guys remember, in episode 55, there was a giant reactive Skibidi skeleton, of which I've made a whole theory. I tried to explain at the time how it was not the literal skeleton, but probably a mechanism with prosthetics that was remotely controlled by someone else. But now I see that Dafuk just went to the spooky horror waters in this episode, so there's not really a point of explaining these skeletons' physics or biology. I think these three guys are a reference to some movie, but I didn't really know which one. So if you guys have any associations, please write it in the comments below. It's really interesting to me. While White Terracotta is busy opening the door, POV looks back to the squad and I see a really weird picture here. Two speakermen are flexing all the way to the door, doing their dorky funny dance. Guys, I think this isn't really the time for this. I really have a feeling no one here is actually bothered about giving their best to the following battle. Expect for Plungerman, Black Speakerman, and the White Terracotta Brother. But he's pursuing the secret agent's goals as we already know, not the Alliance's. As the guys enter the large room, the frame of which Dafuk showed us in his official Discord channel before the release of this episode, I'm getting more and more anxious of what may be waiting for them after. Look at this pool of blood next to the upturned toilet tank and parts of skeletons lying around. I think something devoured this poor Skibidi, as human skeletons no longer have any flash or blood within themselves. Then, a torn-off camera piece drops by POV Plungerman, and this camera looks a bit weird. I remember how in episode 56, cameras were attached to cameramen in a different way. They used to have some sort of iron fastener, while in this episode I see three thick wires instead of this fastener, and I wonder why would Dafuk change this piece of design. Then POV looks upwards and sees a really frightening freak ready to jump at him from above. He looks like a mutant Skibidi, which is much taller than the ordinary cameraman. That may mean he was not created on the model of cameraman or speakerman. He was probably built makeshift. He also has some weird metal mountings around his neck. And instead of a toilet tank, he has something remotely resemblant of a system unit. It was probably him who devoured the Skibidi lying near the big door. And he's about to do the same thing with POV. One cameraman tries to shoot at him from the gun. At least someone is trying to do something while the rest of the group are just standing there mindlessly. 
These pricks are really pissing me off. As the scary thing opens his mouth, I can detect the zombie sound effect from Half-Life 2. He simply rips off the head of a cameraman in front of him and to look at this. There's the blood gashing from the wound. Does it mean that cameramen are actually cyborgs, not robots? Then why some of them don't have any blood at all? That's really boggling my mind. POV hits him a few times, and we can see blood and vapor coming from Zombie's mouth as he does that. Defuke's visual effects gotta be really on point in this episode, but these blows don't do much damage to the prick. So he grubs Plungerman's head and apparently tries to rip it off, as there are glitches all over the screen. But thankfully, Black Speakerman comes to the rescue, because we can certainly rely on this Chad today. He impales Skibidi Zombie's face with his knives, but it's not enough to kill him for good. As POV simply smashes his whole face with the spiky plunger, the eyes of the jerk seem to be crashed, and he's not able to do anything now. And I cannot say it louder now. No other squad member does anything useful. Are they all traitors or just extremely dumb? POV turns to Black Speakerman, which nods to him in silent response as if he was saying, Yeah, buddy, that's rough, but I'll cover your back. Then, as the fight with the crazy zombie mutant is over, a sudden explosion shudders the bunker's walls. And look at this, guys. In the very right corner of the screen, there's the bright green beam, obviously coming from the white terracotta's remote controller. And it hits the panel on the wall. Just a second later, all the doors get opened, and the chaos conquers everything around the squad. In the end of the corridor, you can see the weird skibidi mutants that have the sped-up animation of zombies from Half-Life 2. Notice how some of the skibidi peeking out of the open doors are staying at one spot, while other ones are rushing into the attack immediately. Also, check out this funny-looking guy on the right, whose head seems to be on fire. He really did remind me of Ghost Rider. But then the large door bordering the outer room the guys are in, and the spooky corridor with crazy-looking skibidi in there closes, which actually raises a question from my side. Was the Terracotta Twin responsible for the doors that get open? Or only for that one door that got closed? Was his goal to hurt his team members, or to protect them in order to lead them to some final destination? Because there's a possibility that those mini-doors got open due to the alarm that set off on the higher floors, so the doors unblocked automatically. If you have any ideas about it, guys, please write them in the comments below. As POV turns around, we see that all the panels are activated by the Terracotta Twin already. This guy and the secret agent, whose orders the white bro executes, really seems to know the whole Skibidi lab well, or maybe the tablet gives a pretty good showcase of it. Around them, I saw a few boxes with the writings fragile on it, although I wouldn't say it's something really important. As the whole crowd is rushing to the door, the white terracotta stands at. On the left side, another frightening creature appears. He really reminded me the classic version of Frankenstein's monster from the old movies by Hammer Film Studio. His eyes are closed with the strip of metal that made me think back to the vacuum urinal from episode 46. Fortunately, the terracotta twin acts quick and closes all the doors before anyone could have entered them. As the large door in front of POV closes, we can see a glimpse of the next creature we're about to face just within seconds. Notice how two speakermen are the ones who remained the closest to the door, and one of them managed to escape in the very last second. And of course, those dorks do not feel any sense of danger. Instead, they start acting like the clowns they actually are. And well, let's say the punishment came pretty quickly for both of them, which is a pity. I really like those dummies. They brighten my mood each time they appeared on the screen. Just a moment later, the door simply gets knocked out despite being extremely robust and thick. Two of our clowning buddies get to be torn into pieces, and I'm saying it literally. You can see parts of them all over the place. Then we get to see the main mascot of today's episode, that's Skibidi Michael Jackson with his unique he-he effect, which is a reference not only to the famous singer, but to the indie horror game called The Ayuwoki, where Michael Jackson was a monster that moved at crazy speed and reacted to the sounds the gamers made. We can see how the model of his face here is really similar to the face from The Ayuwoki game. Besides, he has a hat, saws, and the rusty metal weapons, the texture of which is really similar to the one Vacuum Urinal's melee weapons from Episode 46 used to have. I also couldn't help but remember the Skibidi Strider from Episode 47 while looking at Skibidi Jackson's robotic hands, as they are also extremely similar in looks. 
As POV plungerman quickie turn around, ready to run for his life, we can notice two cameramen with green ties on the left, standing there and just mindlessly looking forward at Skibidi Jackson. Remember those poor things later? As the guys are dashing through the corridor, I noticed the box with the numbers 150686 on it, although I didn't see any special meaning behind it. Some members of the squad succeeded in moving past the closing door, but someone is missing. That's our Green Tide brothers. The weight they took at the beginning of the chase cost them dearly. If you'll look closer, you'll see how the one brother's hand is being ripped off and both of them are greatly injured. That's obvious for Black Speakerman who grabs the remote control out of the white terracotta's hands in order to close the door. That they're not gonna make it. But P.O.P. Plungerman, that already saw too many tragedies in this bunker, tries to prove him otherwise. Telling him with the gesture, hold your horses, they'll make it in time. If you guys remember, it was one of those Green Tide brothers who returned the beloved plunger weapon to Plungerman. So I think he has some really warm feelings towards them. But Black Speakerman turns out to be more pragmatic at the moment, and he closes the door just a second before Crazy Skibidi Jackson is about to get in. I found it really strange how this madman was able to crush the thick metal door with such ease, and yet he stopped in front of this one, which seems to be much thinner and partly made of glass. But anyway, what's more important here is the drama between the two friends, and not some stupid door. Black Speakerman returns the remote controller to the Terracotta Twin who leans back slowly. He looks quite devastated as well. POV Plungerman, who is full of emotions, steps closer to his bud and gives him a few heavy punches, but Black Speakerman doesn't even try to respond. Although the hits Plungerman are giving to him are so hard there's even a crack appearing on the guy's red part of the speaker, so he just walks away without responding. Apparently, the Black Speakerman understands his friend's feelings, but he also couldn't do it any other way in order to save the majority of the squad's members. As POV turns his head back to the door, we see that beside Skibidi Jackson, there's the whole crowd of spooky jerks, including Skibidi Frankenstein, zombie mutants, and the guys that came out of the mini doors after they got open. POV gives the middle finger to them all, and I can see how his hand is actually shaking. Too many of his friends died within these few episodes. Then he turns around, and we see the rest of the squad walking straight forward to the yellow light that can be seen in the near distance. It seems like they don't worry anymore. They probably think the major danger has been left behind this door. Those guys are probably in the wrong though, because I hear some strange skibidi noises around them. And I highly doubt it's anywhere being safe now. And on that unsettling and sad note, this crazy part of episode 69 ends. What can I say to you guys? Well, first of all, I'm happy to declare that almost all my theories I've made on what can be seen inside the Skibidi Bunker turned out to be true. Indeed, this episode was revolving around more spooky stuff, similar to the style of Dom Studio Multiverse series. Do you remember Momo from episode 17 of Multiverse Skibidi series? I've made a prediction that Dafuk will show us the new kinds of Skibidi toilets in the bowels of Skibidi Main Lab that would lean more into the horror side as well. And looking at Skibidi Jackson, I understand that I was the closest to the right. Also, I was right about how the story will take more emotional and lore-seeking turn, aside from the action-driven tone of the episodes we saw before. And second of all, I'm really curious of what could happen in the next part of episode 69. I see something similar to the elevator entrance on the right side of the corridor the guys are walking in. What if the point of their final destination is even lower than this? And who will wait for them there, Skibidi Kleiner, or Real G-Man and Skibidi Scientist together? I'll be looking forward to the future episodes. I really hope that you enjoyed today's analysis. And if you did, please hit the like button under this video, and write your own theories on episode 69 in the comments. Be sure to subscribe to my channel not to miss my new videos. And that was me, Isotoilet. See ya!